The first signs of spring slowly reach our snowbound senses. A lone peeper becomes a chorus, and the woodcock's cry breaks through at dusk. One of the earliest flowers, harbinger of spring, rises barely above the forest floor. With wave after wave of sound and color, spring rolls north across the countryside 15 miles or more each day, bringing new life to the woodlands, to the prairies, and to the glades. Spring's an ancient rhythm driven by the sun. Its warmth draws us out to watch, to listen, to measure its passing in the brief bloom of flowers, in the greening of the trees. But the flowers of spring are no passive things to simply name or to measure time. They're creatures like us, caught up in creation, built to build future generations with the aid of insects. More than 130 million years ago, the first flowering plants arose when dinosaurs dominated the Earth. And somehow, these seemingly fragile forms of life survived what the lumbering giants could not. With the lure of pollen, and later nectar, insects and even birds became the wildflower's allies, with each adjusting to the other's needs, until columbine fit the length of the hummingbird's tongue, and aromatic sumac fit the tongue of the solitary bee. For wildflowers, spring is a rush for life, a rush to reach the light of day before trees and grasses cover them in dark summer shade. Most early flowers arrive on energy stored over winter in thick roots or rhizomes, bulbs or corms. Indians use these roots in many ways. From bloodroot, they made a red dye. From golden seal, they created both dyes and early medicines. But for insects emerging early in spring, it's not the root, but the flower itself that counts. Pollen and nectar hidden in the blossom give food when there's little to be found. Spring beauties and bluets seem insignificant for their size, but to early flies and bees, they mean survival. 
and these small insects in turn pollinate the plants so they too can flourish. But not all flower visitors help with reproduction. Some insects simply feed without carrying pollen effectively from plant to plant. Others visit the blossoms only for shelter from wind and rain, or to hide themselves among the leaves and flowers. When luna moths first appear in spring, the pink borders of their wings blend perfectly with gooseberry blooms, where they sometimes hide during the day. The wings of later emerging lunas have mainly yellow borders. Could it be coincidence? Or do the moths change to blend with the changing flowers? There's so much we see, yet so little we know. Many flowers, like the service berry, use nectar to draw insects near. For its own sake, the Monarda flower must hold just enough of this complex liquid to make a visit worthwhile. But not so much that a trip to one flower alone is enough. A honeybee visits over a thousand blossoms to make just a thimble full of honey. Bees, more than other insects, use the nectar and pollen to feed both themselves and their young. Flowers come in many colors, shapes, and scents to lead pollinators past the plant's reproductive parts. Insects see more by color and color patterns than as we do by clear outlines. And some are blind to certain shades. To a bee, a red flower looks black and uninviting, but it draws the hummingbird near. Some blossoms even glow with an ultraviolet intensity in a range of light only the insects can see. Colors may also signal flowers ripe with pollen and nectar. Bluebells change from pink to blue as they bloom. White trillium, another flower of the damp forest, turns pink as the blossom fades. Are there meanings to these changes? Or is it simply that they occur? Honey guides, those spots of color on the blue-eyed Mary's throat, seem to lead insects to the nectar. Wild petunia, a later spring bloomer, has lines instead of spots. The honey guides of the Ohio buckeye change from yellow to red as the flowers fade, a pattern that appears to have a purpose. But getting the insect to the flower is only half the battle. The shape of the blossom also works to put insects in touch with the plant's reproductive parts. Shape determines not only how the flower is used, but who can use it. The open blossoms of the wild hyacinth make it easy for insects to reach its pollen and nectar. The same is true of composite flowers like yarrow, where many small blooms cluster together. This allows more primitive insects like gnats and beetles to simply walk along, rubbing pollen here and there as they go. But more complex flowers like the cream wild indigo demand special skill to reach their pollen stores. The queen bumblebee emerges early in spring. She may be its only true pollinator, the insect to which the indigo owes its survival. By developing difficult blooms, flowers protect themselves from unwanted intruders. But then they're dependent on a very few insects. If these die from loss of nesting places or overuse of pesticides, the flower has little chance to create future generations. Another threat to some native wildflowers comes from an unlikely source, the honeybee which was introduced to America from Europe. Because they're very skilled at pollination and they work intensely on flowers blooming in greatest abundance, more unusual flowers may be ignored. 
Random visitors like the native bees can't keep up with the work of the honeybee. So common flowers may become more common and others may fade away. Searching far and wide through prairies and woods can lead to the most specialized spring flowers, the orchids. The yellow lady slipper is an increasingly rare orchid of damp forests. It's shaped in a most unusual way. Insects follow a tricky course inside the yellow petal. They're forced to touch the female part of the plant as they enter and rub against pollen for the next flower as they leave. Picking any wildflower hurts the plant's chances for survival. And moving most, roots and all, means death. But for many orchids, it's death most certain because some grow only in soil where a special fungus thrives. And only with this fungus can the orchid gather nutrients it needs to live, to grow, to flower. We spend our lives, it seems, rushing against the world, speeding past spring into summer and fall and all over again. Meanwhile, in the solitude of woods and glades, spring unfolds as it has for many lifetimes. in rich, damp forests, along the edge of streams, Virginia bluebells and flocks abound. In a patch of speckled leaves, after seven years of growth, a trout lily finally blooms. Some spring flowers rest hidden beneath a canopy of leaves. Near the forest floor, wild ginger attracts gnats and flies with its dark carrion color. May apple, another hidden blossom, draws wild turkey to its fruit later in the season. Jack in the pulpit and its cousin, the green dragon, both hide flowers at the base of a tall, slender form. It's no easy task knowing these flowers. Rue anemone and false rue anemone look much alike. Solomon's seal hides its drooping blossoms while false Solomon seal sends up a soaring plume. Some common names create confusion, but others may help you find a flower. On glades and dry woods, the leaf of hound's tongue stands rough and fuzzy far below its tiny blue blossoms. Bird's foot violet blooms above a lacy claw-like leaf. The flowers of pussy toes resemble a kitten's paw and cancer root describes the way one small flower gets its strength from feeding off the roots of other plants. Many common names suggest the flower. On spring prairies and glades, you'll find shooting star, Indian paintbrush, yellow star grass, and blue-eyed grass. Fire pinks blaze in dry Ozark woods while Blue-Eyed Mary carpets damp forest floors. But you don't find spring in the name of a flower. You find it out there, walking where the wild things grow, where human voices seldom echo or long ago turn to a whisper.
where the old life gives way to the new, and a flower and a bee work in secret harmony.